warm good evening to one and all. Welcome back again for another session with the Madras Canadian Club. Today we have with us uh, Jodi Van der Steen of Impact Australian Shepherds of the USA. Uh, she has been associated with, it, with Australian Shepherds since 1988. That is uh, more than three decades of association with the breed, and uh, she has bred over 60. Uh, sorry, she has owned over 60 champions, and of which she has bred 31 of them. And uh, uh, the Impact Australian Shepherds are world renowned, and wherever they have been exported, they have made a big mark in the breed and the history of the breed. So welcome, Andrew, Judy. Uh, very nice of you to brave the storm and uh, have come out to uh, reach out to us. So welcome on board. Uh, how do you feel about joining us for a chat session today? Oh, I'm actually pretty excited here. I never got, uh, I was um, shocked when you called me and said that you were interested in talking to me about Australian Shepherds, a little nervous. <laughs> <laughs> so beautiful. So uh, as, as we were slightly delayed today because, uh, as I said, uh, Judy had to storm the weather there. She was having a storm there and she had, had to navigate and to get on there. So we just started with the interview right away. So we just started the first question. So how and when did you get associated with purebred dogs? And since when have you been associated with the Australian Shepherds? Um, my, I have been associated with Australian Shepherds since 1988, but I saw my first Australian Shepherd in 1979. Um, actually, when I went to a bluegrass festival, it had nothing to do with a dog show. But the dog was so intelligent, I couldn't stop thinking about it. So I tried to hunt them down and they weren't even recognized by AKC. And then I found them up in Door County. They were being raised by monks. So I um, contacted the dog club and hunted this breed down. But it took me a few years. That's really nice. And how uh, have you been associated with other breeds? We were having a chat earlier. You said that you had boxers. So yes. when did you start having dogs? So uh, what are the history of you having dogs? I was fortunate to be able to grow up with a lot of animals. Um, we always had two at a time, usually one big and one small. But some of the dogs that I've had would be boxers and terriers, um, toy fox terrier. Um, there's collies, beagles, uh, just to name a few. Um Let's see. I've had the Shih Tzu, Chihuahuas, Pomeranians. I showed them. So that was all, you know, in my course of, you know, showing and stuff like that. I tried the Poms. I, I like them. They're cute, but they're not very healthy. So I decided to not show Poms anymore. <laughs> so, but I've had quite a few. Fair. I think you had a quite your share of uh, having uh, experiences with various other breeds too. So oh, we'll yeah. Let us not digress. We'll go back to the Australian Shepherds. So, we'll move to the next question. So, what are the origin and history of the Australian Shepherds and for what purpose were they developed? Okay. The Australian Shepherd, um, everybody knows them as a herding dog. Um, and that's what they were originally um, bred for. They were actually developed in the United States in the 1800s. But the Basque um, people came here, the Basque, I think you pronounce it, and they were sheep herders. And they developed this dog. And it was with a, um, like a guarding type shepherd um, mixed with a border collie, they think, they think. They don't know. But um, then the Basque people went to Australia and they brought their sheep over there and they brought a couple dogs with them and they got a name in Australia. So they called them the Australian Shepherd, but they did originate in the United States. That was quite amazing. As I was telling you earlier, we were, I was always under the impression that Australian Shepherds were developed in Australia. Then when I did the did a digging of understanding the breed, then I realized that they are actually from USA. So right, right. Yeah. So, so, so what are the breed type defining conformational traits of an Aussie? If, um, 
first of all, when I look at a, a dog, um, I look at them like a person would look at a, a horse, believe it or not. Um, because basically you have, you know, your, your headpiece, your neck, your shoulder on down to the loin and so on. But, um, the Australian shepherd was meant to have a smooth, even, easy gait um, that was flawless and effortless because they had to work all day. Uh, they're very agile on their feet, so they can turn on a dime. They can go back and forth and switch gates um, to do their job. They also uh, have to have an almond eye. Well, they don't have to, but they should have an almond eye, nice length of neck. Um, some of the traits are the colors um, as well, but the color isn't like having to do anything with the the breed itself. I mean, the, the gait. The gait should come, I always say, like a, a, a person swimming, and it should grab and reach ground. Um, and that would give the dog um, length of stride and a lot of drive. Uh, and they also ha can have a curly coat or a smooth coat. Length of coat is common, um, but what's really unique is the eyes. An Australian Shepherd can have two completely different eyes, um, color eyes. One can be blue, one can be brown. But the colors, um, you can even have one eye that has two and sometimes three colors. I don't really see the three colors much, but... Um, I do see two colors a lot, blue, brown, amber, green. Those are all acceptable in our breed. Mm -hmm. Very unique uh, point, I think. So what about the personality trait? How, how would you elaborate the personality trait of an Australian Shepherd? Well, they say that um, Australian Shepherd should be standoffish. Now, I kind of, a lot of that in the ring you don't see, obviously, because the judge wouldn't be able to go over them. But in real life, when they're working and you, a stranger comes around, they don't stop and leave their herd. They still work that herd and you are second. Okay. The sheep are first or the ducks or the cows. They're all first. Um the personalities, um, they're really, really easy to train, smart. Um, a person did my an interview on our kennel in Missouri, and the words he used was, this is actually a dog that thinks before it acts. And he's right, because they have to determine where that sheep is going. They have to bring that sheep back. So... Um, they're good family dogs, very loyal. They pretty much are um, a family dog where if somebody else tells them what to do, they just kind of look at them like, no, <laughs> you're not going to tell me what to do. They can ignore you so good. <laughs> but um, I think those are the strongest traits. Good personality, great family dog, great with kids. Um most of them are very good with other dogs because they're used to working sometimes with more than one dog. Mm -hmm. So um, they can't, they're not supposed to kill um, stock where some dogs get really aggressive and they'll grab on. An Aussie doesn't move stock that way unless they absolutely have to. They will nip a heel um, they normally go for the foot that's down on the ground, which is a good idea because <laughs> the one that comes up is going to kick you. So they 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 think about this stuff before they do it. 
that speaks a lot of things in terms of what the kind of unique personality that an Australian people that. So uh, again, we're talking about the intelligence quotient of an Australian shepherd. So in, in link to that, we have the next question. So Aussie's intelligence and versatility is a widely acknowledged fact. How does this aid them to be suitable for various other sports and work other than just cutting? Oh, yes. Um, this is an all round breed. My goal in my breeding program, I'm not talking about anybody else, but in my breeding program, um, I once said, um, in the field working one day, in the confirmation showing the next day, um, because they can go, this is one breed. For example, I had a dog and um, his name was Tonka. Mm -hmm. And it was it was 90 degrees out. We were in Michigan at the Nationals. My son, I showed him first, and then they had a break. Mm -hmm. And then my son showed him in juniors, because my son has been showing since he's been eight years old. And he's another reason for the su success of our kennel, actually. Um, he's a great handler. But anyway, this dog came in the ring. Went into juniors, he never skipped a beat. We had a standing ovation. The ovation was for the dog, not us, because he just didn't quit. He just went from one to the other. Um, so you can take this dog from confirmation. They're famous for agility. Um they are getting well known in fast cat and end up to be about 23 miles per hour 24 which is pretty fast um they are good for obedience and nose work mm -hmm. uh, i have two in nose work lots of them in herding they all got titles and i hope to soon have my hall of fame because of it you have to get several titles in everything so um uh, to be able to get into Hall of Fame. And that's what my goal is. We have a question from one of our audience. So are show Australian shepherds bred intentionally with a straight trend for a regal look, as they have a natural slouch due to the disair shoulder angle and posture? That is his question. Huh. Let me see. Um... You know, I'm a little confused on the question because Aussies aren't supposed to have a straight front. So you're um, asking whether uh, is that becoming a phenomenon in the ring that they are bred for the straight, they are bred with a bit of a straight front so that they're able to give a legal look. That is the question that comes to our question, John. No, if you you know that picture that you put up before of um, Teddy. Mm -hmm. we'll show the picture one second. Share the screen right away. Okay. That's a good one. Yes. Okay. Right here, um, as you can see, his bib or the white, his posternum is out further than his shoulder. Um, so, and the Shoulder should be, I've never quite seen one at 45 degrees, but the standard says 45 degrees. Um, Teddy's about as close to that as you can get. Um, his legs are straight, but he has depth of chest down to his elbow and then a slight tuck up as he goes back. Now, the, the dip in his back, that is where the back goes and the loin starts. That's about where that dip should be, but really it shouldn't be like a sway or anything like that. Mm -hmm. um, so the shoulder angle and the posture um, should look just like this dog. The hock should be straight, not too long. Mm -hmm. And they have to have a little spring in their stifle. So the, I'm, I'm sorry, in the um, pastern in the front. The, the pastern in the front, they have to have a little angle there too because of working. If it was 
straight, it would break down too easily in the field. And they would not be able to work for the whole day, as you said. They need to right. Break they have to work all day long. I mean, these dogs are coming into the from the field. Teddy actually works. Okay. So he's, and so does Rock. And actually, several of my dogs do. So I think that answers uh, Mr. Radhakrishnan's question. And he has another question also. You had mentioned okay. about uh, nipping. So with the nip being a desired trait, what's your piece of advice on how to dissuade this habit in your Aussies with humans? Oh, I do this when they're puppies. Okay. I don't let them mouth me. Um, it's it, in my world, it's not acceptable to bite, nip anything. I mean, once in a while when we're baiting in the ring, they'll, you know, they'll get overzealous and grab the bait. Um, but basically what we try to do, just like any owner does, um, my dogs are all brought up in the house mm -hmm. and I, when they get excited, I mean, they're puppies, they want to nip, they want to, they're herding dogs. So they'll grab your pants legs or they'll walk around your feet a lot. That's actually the biggest thing that they do. But as far as nipping, I've never had really a dog that nipped. Might nip a child a little bit until I teach the child what to do. But what they're trying to do is herd them back. Now they do um, change from the nipping to the pushing. So they will push a, a child, you know, instead of nipping them. So how do you dissuade this? Uh, that is the question as such. And then you are, are you are saying that you'll correct them. So how do you correct them? As such? Uh, I just the, tell them no and I I pinch them. Myself, I'll pinch their lip or pinch them to know what they're doing. That part is wrong. I, I've had great success with that in every breed that I have had mm -hmm. for nipping. Um, and believe it or not, the biggest nipper I had was a Chihuahua. <laughs> but the Aussies don't really do that. They, they'll do it when they're puppies and they will nibble on your chin, but they don't like snap. It's not a fear snap. It's like, move, move, get going. I want you over here. But I don't want them to do that. There's a time and a place, you know. So I just pinch their, I pinch their lip, or I catch their tongue, or I'll, I'll just pinch them right in, right here, and to let them know that's not. And I do a good pinch because they have to know that it's not something that I want. So, but uh, when you train this habit into them, that you pinch them, and there's a conditioning that you're not supposed to nip. How do you get them to do that in the field? With a it's natural. Okay. It's natural. That comes natural. Sometimes the dogs don't want to herd right away. Usually the second or third time, they're like, oh, I can chase this. Oh, this is great fun. Once they think of it and it clicks, they're, they're on it. They just can't stand sitting still. They want to help. So, so when you usually get them oriented when you get a puppy to go and get exposed to the herding business. Actually, I have puppies at home right now that are um, going on 10 weeks old and they're beautiful. In fact, I got five of them because six of them because I can't decide. Um, yeah, it was a litter of 10 and I still have six because I'm not ready to let go because I want to decide which ones I want in what homes that are going to be the best for them. Um, but they're exposed to ducks. We have ducks. Okay. Um, and I start my puppies out on ducks okay. because a sheep can actually hurt them. And so can a cow. Um, and they need to learn. So I let them run the ducks like you wouldn't believe. And they just think it's the biggest game. Sometimes I um, we put the ducks away at night, so I take all the puppies out and I let them go after them and run around and do what they want. I just take them with me all the time. And the next thing you know, they it it's in their brain that I need to help. It's time to work. I had a dog that at five o'clock, she'd come and get me. Let's go. It's We got to go do chores. So... They look forward to it. They're great at that. That's really lovely. 
So that gives us a perspective of how the current independence when you get started with, with the puppy. To the Eight to weeks, the I shove them out there. Uh, as soon as they can run, I, you know, I have them out there and expose them to different things all the time. Beautiful. So we go on to the next one. So the next question is about colors. We were speaking earlier about colors also. So what are the colors which are recognized in the breed and what been your preference for the show ring? I really as don't have a preference, <laughs> as you can see. Um, I don't have a preference. I do, I think all the colors are beautiful, um, and it depends on the dog that has them, obviously. But because um, I see my first, my eye goes right to structure first. Mm -hmm. um, and then it goes to color because I want to know that the color is right because you can get disqualified if the white goes past the shoulder. Okay. So um, that's one of the, the qualifications for showing. Um, there is a black tri, mm -hmm. okay? And then there is a blue merle. And that's really just a diluted black tri. It's got a dilute gene that dilutes it down to make it a merle. And then there's a um, the blue merle and the red merle. But I am going to elaborate on something for you. Yeah. I just been talking to the genetics department. And I had them explain this to me. Because out of this litter that I just had that's 10 weeks old, I have what you call according to the genetics people is a blue try okay. now i found out that this is a very rare color so rare that it's not accepted by okay. akc or the parent club asca australian shepherd club of america it is not even accepted um, what it looks like is a black tri. That's one big dilute spot. It's they're gray, okay. but all the trim is there. The white, the copper, it's all there. So um, I was saying I got two silver puppies. This must be wrong. Now they do have that. It's called fever coat. The fever coat is different, though, because the fever coat will have the original color head. It'll be the right colors, and the rest will be diluted. But what happens with a fever coat is normally that will shed out, and then you'll get the normal coat color in, which will be the black or the merle or something like that. So, But that was a new finding for me this year, actually, because I've never seen it before. So I had to investigate. That's just, and I found out it's because I bred a blue merle male to a black tri. I thought she's actually um, a blue merle that is doesn't have any spots. So you can have that too. So yeah, I guess you know it's kind of important to know. Um, but we didn't do the coloring before we didn't and the black try is going to be dominant. So, so it didn't come out to be, I mean, I had both blue merles and black tries obviously, but I got these gray puppies, which is called the blue, um, try. So, and they were both tries. So that's, um. So, but uh, now that you have an instance of this kind of a color, uh, so what will be the stand of Australian uh, Shepherd Club of America? Will they look into it uh, from a genetics point and will they look into recognizing that color in the future? What is your view? You know, it's hard to tell what they're going to do. I know that the genetics people feel that it should be a recognized color because it does happen, um, but that's not my um, expertise. I listen and I try to learn, but um, and right now it's just the merles and the tries. Oh, and there's a buy too, a buy, which is two colors, and those are also legal. But as you know, if you breed a blue to a blue, mm -hmm. you can get, um, if one eye is white um, and there's no pigment around the eye, 
then that dog that dog could be blind. The same with a white ear. Um, you can have a deaf puppy from that. So we don't want white Australian shepherds ever. <laughs> yeah. So we, we were discussing boxes. We already have a big uh, debate and dispute about white boxes being red. So as you said, right. let us not have a white box. So we have another question related to the queer color scheme again. So does a merle color have any specific link to the original furry work that the breed was developed for? You know, I don't think it does. Although they used to call it the little blue dog. Yeah. Um, that's what it was before. It was called the Australian Shepherd. In the U.S., it was called the sheep shepherd and i know this because of looking through old family photos my grandpa um had a sheep shepherd and they'd always talked about the sheep she shepherd and they kept on telling me it looks just like your australian shepherds but it had a tail <laughs> i'm like well they probably just didn't cut it off or it wasn't a bob so that's, uh, but everything else looked just like it. And it happened to be a black dry. And I said, mom, that's an Australian shepherd. And it just has a tail. <laughs> so. So that is, it gives an interesting uh, fact into how the colors were and how the dogs were, uh, the breed was itself at this <laughs> earlier. I know it's been known as the Australian shepherd. I know it's just, it, it, it was, it was crazy how the name came, but um, yeah. But um, I don't really think it had anything to do with the herding or the working, or the development of the dog. Okay. Um, as a matter of fact, on um, every dog, I have to do a DNA panel. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't have to, but I do. I prefer okay. to because um, as a responsible breeder, you know that when you breed or you breed for confirmation, and the confirmation, as I argue with people with this all the time, the confirmation of your dog is very important because the confirmation is what they need to look like and their bone structure needs to be to perform their job. So like this lady said to me one time, well, that doesn't make them any better or any worse in the herding ring. And I said, do you think that these people just came up with breed standards for these dogs? This is what they are bred to do. So their standard is is to do their job. It's not for the confirmation. Mm -hmm. I mean, we do want to make it a better breed. Everybody does that has dogs. So, you know, yeah, it's very important to have the right confirmation on your dog to do its job. So you were talking about this DNA panel that you do. So what are the, what are the uh, findings that you get out of a DNA panel in that? I am asking oh. you this out of blue because I am quite curious because we are trying to open up uh, in India, they are trying to open up for artificial insemination and all these aspects. So we are still at a very nascent stage of DNA testing. So what do you, what do, you do in DNA paneling? What do you get to understand? Okay. First of all, you have to do the DNA panel for your breed because okay. uh, breeds are different. So um, some have heart problems, some have eye problems. So in the breed panel, it will tell you, it depends on how extensive you want to get too. I mean, we go, I go right down to coat color. So I know if mine are going to, you know, if they have the Merlin gene, I know if they have, you know, um, it, it tells you if they are going to have cataracts. Um, um, MDR1 is a popular one for uh, herding dogs with a Merle gene. MDR1 is associated with Merling. Um, what it does is it stands for multiple drug reactions. So basically, um, you cannot give your dog ivermectin because um, it will put it in a coma. Um, basically, it will kill it. So there are several different you know, drugs on the market. Um, some of the popular ones are for heartworm and flea and tick. Um, and them have ivermectin in them. I have to always search for something that doesn't have ivermectin. So, I mean, it has, um, it tests for DM, which is degenerative myelopathy. It, it has like 
eight things that it tests for. Now, if I take the boxer in, like my nephew's boxer, if I take that dog in, it's going to have a whole different panel that I have to do. So you have to do it according to breed. And by all means, if you have a question on, you know, a DNA panel or a OFA, um, make sure you call them up and ask. Tell them to, you know, really break it down. I had to do that with these gray puppies. I just didn't know where they came from. Never saw one. 35 years, I never saw a gray Aussie. So it was a concern of mine. And I wanted to know if I breed this again, am I going to get more? You know, and I could, but you, ha again, you have to, you know, not all your breedings that you plan turn out to be, uh, you know, 100% perfect. I should always say there is always nature's hand in it. We can only try our best as breeders to achieve something, but there is either a God's hand or a nature's hand in terms of. Yeah. 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 It's That's very it. hard. <laughs> so we are talking about Asi and we saw your beautiful uh, boy, Teddy. So how uh, difficult is Aussie as a breed to groom and present for the consumption? Oh my so goodness. I, I saw Teddy, I saw Rock, and I was always flabbergasted with how well they were groomed and presented. So how do yeah. you, you listen to you and talk about that? Well, as you heard me say earlier, we will live in, live in a climate where it can be 100 degrees in the summer mm -hmm. and it can be uh, 30 below in the winter. Okay. So ours get you know, a pretty good coat because of climate. They adapted to the climate. Um, but yeah, if you want to take all the breeds and say, is it difficult to groom? You'd have to say yes. Um, not because of what you have to do, but well, actually the brushing and the drying take a lot. Um, the standing jokes are that the Australian Shepherd only sh uh, sheds once, twice a year for six months each time. <laughs> but um, what I like to do is uh, I'll give you my routine. Everybody's different. I am my background. I am a hair designer. Okay. And um, so and so is my son. Yeah. And um, he's an excellent groomer. And I groom a lot. Um, so when I go to the shows, that's my job now. I have to groom. I'm the bucket person, you know. <laughs> but I groom. I I brush out all the coat the coat with a rake, and I take out all the dead coat that I can get. And then I go and I line brush over that and take and take lines and I part it. And I brush that down and then I make another two inch part and I brush all that out. And I do that to the whole dog. I start actually from one side, then the other side, and then I do the back and front. Um, and then so I come through that and then after they're all brushed out and I can't get any more hair, then I throw them in the tub. I wash them, suds them up take them out of there, dry them off, put them on the table, start blow drying them. It takes eventually about an hour um, with a force dryer. And we also use um, a, hot, a hot dryer like we would use for our own hair. Um, there's, I've seen people using um, flat irons on them to take the curl out, uh, I'm pretty lucky because I have a smoother coat. I've had a couple that have cur curly coats. Um, they're hard to get that curl out, but I can do it. Um, you're not supposed to have any products in the dogs. Uh, they're supposed to be shown naturally, our breed anyway. You and I both know that there's a lot of products used in a lot of dogs. There just is. That's a fact. Um, but other than a little hairspray on the legs or something like that is usually all we need. Um, and we brush them all out, dry them, and then comes the trimming. Um, 
we use a straight shears and then we also use a, a thinning shears. Um, all the pads get taken down because we want their pads uh, bare so that they can maneuver fast. And we and the nails are kept short, although not too short, not like a boxer or a Doberman where they're drawn right back. We want a little nail there. Um, and then, then we just kind of basically uh, use the thinning shears to um, blend like the skirts or the pants, um, all the fringe work. I take the ears, you know, down and make them clean up a little bit. I don't take the, whis uh, the whiskers off because basically they're supposed to have that like feelers for, for hurting. If they get down and they come close and their whiskers hit a hoof, they know to back off because it, it tells them. It gives them but distance. I'm quite, but I'm quite surprised because I have always found the opinion that in the United States, you always take off the whiskers. They show the dog very clean. and not A lot of people do. A lot. I don't. I don't take it off. Um, because your dog because is, uh, both multi-purpose. He comes to the confirmation ring and goes back to the... Yes. To work, so make them have that. No, no. Yeah. So do, do and you feel that uh, not having whiskers, having the whiskers give you a, gives you a disadvantage in front of a judge? Do I repeat that? I'm, I'm saying if, if you want to have whiskers, you want to leave the whiskers on. Do you feel your dog is and the dis, uh, has a disadvantage in when when he's being judged in comparison to a dog who's got no whiskers, all clean? You know what. They say that it takes a good judge three minutes to examine a dog. In three minutes, I don't think they can catch everything. Um, basically, I I really don't think that the whiskers, the whiskers, if they take them off, it does look a little cleaner. But then, you know, my dogs, like I said, they have to go from one ring to the next. And I'm not going to put them in danger. Uh, so I leave things that are supposed to be for their job. Totally like we don't have back dew claws. Mm -hmm. If they have back dew claws, we have to take them off because mm -hmm. they work low to the ground and that if they catch it, they can rip them right back. So they like them dew claws tight and the back ones, they don't want them on. But most of the time, Aussies don't even have back dew claws. Back. It's rare to see one. Okay. okay, so we'll move on to the next question, which is more on breeding. So how difficult is an Australian Shepherd as a breed to breed for consistency in fact? You have been breeding for uh, young years now, I think 30 odd years. So how difficult is a breed to breed consistently? Well, <clears throat> when you look at the breed, the first thing you should do is like the dog that you're going to. So right now I am picking my next stud dog. And so I keep on looking at breeds. I mean, at uh, type, um, I see a dog I like, and then I contact the person. And then the next thing I do is I ask about their DNA, mm -hmm. if their eyes cleared, and if they had their hips tested or their elbows. And they, you know, and so these are important things that you bring to the table. Um, and then you just hope for the best because I bred to a beautiful dog in the United States. Um, he's very old now, but it was an awful litter. It turned out, I mean, this dog produced really well, but with the one that I bred him with, he didn't produce well at all. Okay. Out of five puppies, we got one show puppy and we did finish them, but I wouldn't put him up there on the list as far as being superb. Um, I mean, I've seen people bring mediocre dogs in and they get a championship, but they're, and I tell people, you can show your dog or you can special your dog, mm -hmm. but to have a special, um, don't think you're going to get in there with just a common dog. It's, you, it needs to really bring something to the table. And it sure helps when the dog is happy and upbeat and likes to show. We have also taken some dogs that were beautiful, but they don't like to show. They just want to be in the herding ring or they want to be in the agility ring. 
you know what? We let them because if they don't want to show, they're not what we want in the show ring because they're going to turn off. They're going to turn off and turn down. So we want the best that we can get. Makes a lot of sense. But I'm very sure even these dogs, which are not uh, cut for the confirmation drink, are very good uh, about the base or foundations for good breeding programs because they are still interested in the herding ring. Still interested in the right? Yes. And you know, in our competition in the United States, it's nothing to go into the ring. Like our nationals at one time was 2,000 dogs. I mean, that's a lot of dogs to compete against. In 2000, I'm going to say 2013 or 2015, one of the two, I can't remember right now. Um, we had a dog named, we have him yet. Uh, his name is Apollo. Okay. He took winner's dog in Tennessee. Um, every show except for one, he took best opposite. Yeah, I held that dog back from his championship to show at the nationals. <laughs> so, and I said, let's just bring him. And believe it or not, this dog broke its leg when it was eight weeks old. It's hind leg. And still won the nationals. And he just, but he loves to show. And that makes a difference. And Teddy is his son. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we have, we're lucky. We're, we're lucky that we have dogs that are just happy and they carry that on too. We will show a picture of Teddy because that's a sight to see again. <laughs> There's, I sent you lots of them. The other one that I sent you is Rock. That's Teddy. Yep. That is Teddy again. That is yep. Teddy in the Sydney Royal 2021, isn't it? <laughs> he, he likes his high fives, that's for sure. He is also right now, as you can see, and I'm pretty proud of this, that he's the number one dog in Australia out of all breeds. Fantastic. That's a commendable achievement, I would say. And I'm very happy to say that this poster has been designed by our very own uh, CVC, <laughs> Chetan, from India. Oh, really? <laughs> I didn't so even know that. That makes an Indian connection to the poster. <laughs> I'm very happy and proud about that. He, he's part of the our dogs team. So it's a real problem. Goodness, That's you should do idea. some of my ads back here. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure uh, Chetan will write to you. So this is Teddy again, uh, wonderful headshot. So in 2019, Rock won the um, Sydney Royal. Okay. And I got the call about 2 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> and yeah, I was yeah, so excited. Rock is the blue Merle dog. Yeah. Cool. yeah. That's, yeah. And that's my friend, Belinda West. She's in Australia and she loves my dog. So after she um, got to show um, yeah, Rock, cool. then she asked me if I would enter a dog for her at Westminster because she wanted to show at Westminster one time in her life. Okay. And I, I sent her Teddy. I, I brought Teddy there. She never saw him be, before, walked in the ring with Teddy and took a um, award of merit. So she was pretty excited. And then she just talked to me about bringing him out there. And I said, sure. But he's in really good hands. And, and he comes back um, in uh, um, around December, January, somewhere in there. That is really lovely, but I, I was uh, I heard that uh, CDC has come back with some restrictions and have uh, around 100 countries on ban list. I'm sure Australia is not one of them, but uh, I think owing, owing to some rabies uh, concerns, I, I heard that in America, CDC has put some 100 countries on ban where dogs yep. of these countries can't enter into the USA. Isn't it? So that is going to be a bit of a challenge. <laughs> Actually, the Canadian border has been closed because of COVID. Um, yeah. So COVID really put a damper on things for us. I don't know about you, but, you know. Um, we have not had yeah. a dog show for the last two years. 
yeah, yeah. Oh, you haven't? No. We just started up actually. Um, you know, because this was like a, a year and a half off, just like everywhere in the world, you know. So the dog shows are starting back up. Um, but they're all basically outside now because it's the summer. And then when we go inside, we have to wear the mask. But mm -hmm. um, Teddy today, I just learned, um, he's still number one dog, all breed. And he's on his 20th best in show. And Rock had, Rock had 31 best in shows. And he is the highest in the world. I think so I was proud. Break that record shortly. We're hoping. <laughs> yeah, the way the things are going, I think Teddy is really going to break the record. So we have another interesting question from uh, Mr. Radha Krishna Swaminathan. So how difficult is it for an all-rounder judge to understand and judge the Aussie? He is not a breed specialist, he's an all-rounder. So how difficult is it to understand the Aussie? What are your views? We have, um, it's just like anywhere else. When you get in, being that I'm becoming a judge, I know what we have to do to be able to breed or to be able to judge that breed. And you have to know um, your breed standard. And I live by my breed standards. Um, no matter what somebody tells me, oh, you need longer leg, you need longer leg, you need bigger bone, you need this, you need that. You know what? No, I'm doing just fine the way I am and I am going to the breed standard. Um, for instance, I was judging a show in Washington mm -hmm. and I know my breed standard inside out. And the, um, the girl, there was this dog there. That it moved beautifully. It really did. It had no upper arm. It had no post sternum. The post sternum was concave. It was in instead of out. It's supposed to be out, you know. And then, it, but this one was in. So I'm like digging in its chest trying to see where the post sternum is. And... It, it was just very faint, but I'm like, this is not the structure this dog is supposed to have, whether it be good movement or not. Mm -hmm. So when you're trying to pick the best one for that day, which is how you're supposed to judge, it's on a daily basis, not that's the best one of the year. Mm -hmm. um, you have to pick the dog apart. What I told her was, I love your dog. I love your dog's movement. However, it has no post sternum. Therefore, when you breed, you may want to consider that. And I thought I'd just tell you. She turned around really ignorant, basically, basically, and said to me, Lady, I'm her judge. Lady, the dog, the dogs are judged on movement. You better learn that. And I turned around to her and I said, you show me that in the breed standard. And I'll take back my statement. She came back later and said, and she apologized. And she goes, oh, I just learned who you were. I have to apologize to you. And I said, it's all right. Go have fun. You know, but. Happy that good things prevailed. Yeah, it's. It's not really the, it, there's judges out there, just like in any breed that really shouldn't be judges. I mean, I was ring store for a show, well, five shows actually. And two of the judges were very good, very good. And they know procedure and they knew the Aussies, their breeder judges. And then we had two that I have no idea how they pick or what they were looking for. So basically, it's it does make a difference in your judge. And every judge thinks they understand the breed. 
so um just like any other breed if you win something um and you have a type mm -hmm. you know to bring that type to that judge if that judge likes long and low you don't bring them something you know short and tall so you get to know your judges um very well and what i do is i keep a folder mm -hmm. and now they have a program on your phone that you can i take the picture of the judge okay. and then i attach it to all my notes the reason i do that is because i'm a sight person instead of you know i have to see the picture i don't i don't connect by name it's always sight but that's what i do and then i'll say no i'm not showing to this judge or oh we got to go here so okay so that i think i hope that answered answer that yeah i'm pretty, pretty sure uh, chris had that uh, so we will again go back to the question that we were handling about the breeding so this is our question again so what are your views on various breeding methodologies like there are inbreeding outcrossing and line breeding programs so what has have been your tried and tested success in this um what we do is now this is between my son my niece which i sent dogs to my niece because she wanted to start showing now we kind of pair up as a team and really discuss dogs um what we like to do first of all like i said we take we'll go um through all the health testing mm -hmm. Um, after we see a dog we like, then we want to see a video of the dogs down and back. Okay. And then a side video. Um, hopefully we get to see them in, in person. Um, so we breed a dog and we have that dog there. Where we know the lines behind it. Um, I like to breed out mm -hmm. of the line and then have a puppy and then bring it back into something that's fabulous okay. and strong all the all through like um apollo teddy rock those are all really strong contenders and so i might take one of these puppies that i have here um and it is my line um i leased a bitch back for breeding so it was all my lines in there and then i brought that back that back i i bred it out mm -hmm. to a to um picasso and now we're going to bring breed that back in again your own, your own so it's out then in and i like to do out once or twice and then back in mm -hmm. if i got an exceptionally nice dog then or, or, or bitch i will bring them back in to one of my top males okay and then you know and obviously you pick your type because that's what draws your eye so you're saying that you do a combination of an outcross and then an inbreeding i mean line breeding program I'll get them back yes. to your line breeding program okay yeah um it was a little hard for me to understand the concept um like they say a good cross and this is dna again a good cross is an uncle to a niece that's a good cross um they can even do a father to a daughter that's in that's not called inbreeding that's called in humans it's called inbreeding in dogs it's line breeding so um you might want to bring some trait out like i'm a big movement fan I'm, you know, I I have a a friend that was one of my mentors. She is a head judge all the way. Okay. Um but I, my famous saying was they don't move on their heads. You know, so I, I want a strong strong down and back. Okay. Um I want the correct movement on the side. Um and when i say that i mean the dog should have enough reach and drive they're reaching and grabbing ground the bottoms the back of their 
drive is their the drive part is I should be able to see the bottom of their feet mm -hmm. when they're driving. Um, the pads of their feet. Yeah, yeah, the pads of their feet. I want to I want to see that when it comes up. If I don't see that, that dog isn't moving like it's supposed to move, and it's not moving like it can do it all day. Mm -hmm. It has to be able to work all day. And of course, I'm just talking about the Australian Shepherd. I'm not talking about any others because every you know dogs have different gates for different purposes. Okay. That makes a lot of sense in terms of breeding methods and how uh, you are, you have been able to envisage your own type and uh, breeding methodologies. Yeah. But uh, is that, now there is a lot of uh, mathematics that goes into it. Now there's a lot of talk about uh, inbreeding coefficient and all this stuff. Do you have that in your mind when you uh, plan a breeding? Uh, they say uh, the inbreeding coefficient shouldn't be more than 10 percentage, for example. So what are mm -hmm. your views on that? Do you think about it or do you consider that at all? You know, I, I'm i still in it. And I'm, I'm not ashamed to say this. The coefficiency thing, I quite don't understand it. Um, and... I never understand what what understood what they were talking about. I tried it, and I didn't see anything that made a big difference. Okay. Um, I've seen mistake breedings bring out beautiful dogs. <laughs> I, I, I have. Uh, so as far as the coefficiency goes, I know it's an important thing with DNA, but I'm not a DNA expert. Um, so I really, you know. I don't know if the coefficient is as important in breeding. And the reason I say that is because of you, because there's, I've seen people have two dogs that should have never been together and come out with something that was knock your socks off gorgeous. And yet the coefficient wasn't according to that. It didn't make sense. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't really go by coefficiency. My son um, looks at that a lot more than me. Um, and my niece, um, she doesn't really use it either. But okay. it is a factor. And But I don't dabble in it because I really don't know it as well. Kelly, Kelly, my son, which is my handler too, he is, he's more into that kind of stuff. And he does help me with planning the breedings too. Okay. So as you said, you have different minds put together to decide on what to go ahead and breed. Oh, sorry. Okay. Sorry. Somebody That's came. <laughs> Fair point. So we will uh, again go back to one of the questions of our uh, so here's another question from Radha Krishna. He asked, I saw a miniature or she accepted anywhere. Uh, he's yes. Showing that uh, PKC or AKC does not approve. Um, they are accepted. I, the toy isn't that I know of yet, but the miniature is. In fact, I have some. Um, they're moss. Uh, um, I think there's also a picture of you with the miniature. Let me show you. Go ahead. Tell, about, yeah. tell us about it. I'll show you a picture. Mm hmm <laughs> So that's a miniature, isn't it? Yes. And actually, I almost finished him in a weekend in Kentucky, and they pulled and broke the major. So he needed one point. So I had to take him to another show. Otherwise, he would have been done in three days. Okay. Okay. So you're telling us about the miniature. Please go ahead. I'm sorry if I interrupted you. <laughs> no, that's fine. I mean, I like miniatures and I know a lot about different breeds. I'm not, I don't like the toys because obviously I know that the minis that I have are from true Aussies. They're Aussies that were bred down. But the toys, something else was always brought in, like a palm or a chihuahua or something like that. So, um, and I mean, they're supposed to be a herding breed. What are they going to herd? You know, I, I don't know what they're going to herd because they get hurt. And they're usually their little legs are so skinny. I, I'm not for the toy breeds at all, but for the other ones, I'm okay. 
So I think that answers Chris's question. So he has another mm -hmm. question on the tail. So natural bobtail versus dog tail. What do you personally prefer? Um, I've had natural bobtails that I've had to dock because oh. they're not they're not short enough. Um, I dock my own tails. I was taught by a veterinarian. Um, I don't use the guillotine method or a knife method. I don't like it. Uh, I don't use banding, which a lot of people do. But if you put a rubber band on your finger for uh, too tight for a day, it's going to pound, you know. And um, I don't, I don't like that method. But if you can get a bobtail that's um, you know short enough, then it's great. But if you get a bobtail, I mean, it doesn't matter if they're in any other ring than the confirmation ring. But in the confirmation ring, we usually end up docking the tails. I think in, in all my dogs that I've ever had, I've only had to have one that I never had to dock. Okay. So that makes sense. And I think that answers Chris's uh, question. So though you might prefer a natural bobtail, you usually get to don't get the right legs and you end up docking, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And you can't dock over by you, can you? You're not supposed you're, to dock. We are talking about in India? Yes. Yeah, in India, we are still allowed to dock and crop. Oh, okay. We, we, have we can crop In Australia, can... they are not. And yeah, in, yeah, uh, in yeah Europe, Iceland, Europe, no. Asia, uh, a, lot of part, a lot of parts of Asia, they can't. So... In India, I think we still have the privilege and let's hope it stays for some more time. <laughs> yeah. So we will go to the next question on puppy evaluation. So how and when do you evaluate the show prospects of a litter? And what are your secrets in picking up the right puppy over the decades of the breed? Anything else? Well, actually, have, uh, I'll tell you <laughs> about how you pick up Teddy and Rock. <laughs> yeah. Actually, um, I'm doing it a little different nowadays because um because i have the time and i'm retired okay. um i like looking at puppies at um between six and seven weeks uh and i think they're more true to form although there's a lot of people that like looking at them at eight weeks and eight weeks the magic number um i am going on 10 weeks with yeah <laughs> Yep. And on my litter that I have right now, for example, I am at 10 weeks. Okay. And in them, two weeks from the 8 to 10. These puppies have changed so much. Mm -hmm. um, their, their bone seems to come in around 10 weeks. It's coming in. You'll see them knuckling over where they get that big, you know, bone lump right there. Yeah. yeah. And I'm, I know they're going to grow. And um, so I like to wait until they get about 10 weeks old. And then I can see, wow, look at what's happening to this puppy. Um, in the past two weeks, I went for puppies that had, you know, I was like, is this puppy, are these puppies going to get bone? Their father has a lot of bone. The mother is moderate. So just so they're not slight um because they have to be a little heavier bone to work obviously i mean you don't want them snapping if they get kicked so in the in the interim though between the eight and ten weeks there's been a lot of changes so now i think my new favorite time to look at a puppy and my last two litters three litters um i let the pets go the ones that are for sure pets I let them go. And how I pick my pets is I just sit outside and I watch them move. I watch them move and I put them on the table and I stack them up and I feel them. And I, and then I, you know, and you think that they would feel the same in two weeks, but they don't. Sometimes um, the post-turnum is a big one. The fronts on the Aussies still needs quite a bit of improvement. The rears are pretty nice, but you can fix a, it's hard fixing a front. Um, and it's hard to get the right front. The rears, they've come a long way. 
but um, the right fronts, you have to you have to wait until that comes in. And if that doesn't come in, I stand behind my dogs. If my dogs aren't uh, showing to their ability or to to what they do, they should be. I say, you know, I stand behind them. You have no loss with me because if that's not, I want to see them. Don't get me wrong. I don't let people like, oh, it didn't, it didn't move right. I need a different dog. Mm -hmm. I don't do that. I say, let me see it. I'll evaluate it because nine times out of 10, it's the handler. <laughs> so. So that makes sense. Mm -hmm. In terms of for the I mean, change in terms of age and all this stuff. Maybe it's again to do with the breed. Maybe some breeds are uh, evaluated well at eight weeks. Uh, that it's good information from you that Aussies, we better hold on. If somebody's breeding an Aussie, better hold on till they're 10 weeks old so you get to understand how they're going to turn up. So yes. So we move on to the next one. We talk about health. You already spoke in brief about the uh, DNA panel. So can you be very specific about what are the genetic health predispositions that the Aussies have heard as a predisposed prone to? You um, about DNA, what else uh, are there? Well, the, they're prone to um, have drug reactions. They're prone mm -hmm. to um, have a lot of the genetic stuff that we test for. Um, and that's why I do the genetic testing so that I could try to get away from those things that, you know, aren't good. Now, over the years, um, we've gotten better because we didn't have that years ago. Um, so we make sure that if I have one copy, you can still breed it. You just want to breed to something else that's clear mm -hmm. in that to make it better. But, um, they're, they do have some health issues, not a lot compared to others. And some of them don't happen until their old age or they come, you know, become old. And that's what brings it on is the age. And sometimes you can't get away from that. But most of the time, as far as being healthy, they're pretty adaptable. And so far, knock on wood, I've been pretty lucky with that. That's nice. No. So they don't really have either. heart problems. They don't have the heart problems as much. They don't have the, you know, a deep chested dog like the boxers and the Dobermans where they should eat higher uh, and have their food brought to them, you know, up higher so that they, mm -hmm. their stomachs, they don't get the bloat and they don't twist their stomachs. So, but Aussies don't have that. That's, that's a good thing to know. And uh, when talking about health, there is another question from Mr. Radhakrishnan. He asking about uh, spondylosis. How serious do you think is a problem based on the breed? Well, it must not be really. Um, it must not be real, a real problem because I don't even know that word. Okay. I I don't even know what it is. So I don't think that's um, even something that I've heard of in our breed. I'm sorry. I don't know anything so, about that. At least with 30 years of your being exposed to the breed and in your lines and the dogs that you have known, you're not come across that. So Chris would note that. Uh, Chris is someone who's a, a huge follower of our sessions and he asks a lot of relevant questions. So I think that answers his question. So we'll move on back to our questions. Uh, so this is something that I wanted to ask you. In your decades as a breed, as a specialist breeder and a breed specialist, how has the breed improved or deteriorated in the last two decades? Is a breed still fit for function? Yes. As a matter of fact, I'm an advocate on this. Um, I hear a lot of people say, oh, the dogs that we used to have, they were so fabulous. And I'm like, blah, blah, blah. We, if I look back at dogs that I had when I first started, I would not even put them in the ring. I, I mean, they they don't even compare to what's out there right now. If we had Teddy 30 years ago, 
there it would have been unbelievable the dog would have been worldwide famous and well he is actually worldwide famous but <laughs> but you, you know where i'm coming from he's um the dogs from a long time ago let me tell you you get a red merle and they had no coat they had none they look like a a, a smooth or a short coat um, and so the coats came in later on. It was hard to, when I first started, I didn't want a red or a red Merle because they didn't have any hair, um, okay. as far as like, you couldn't do anything with it. They looked spindly, their legs were thin and no bone and snipey, um, a lot of round eyes back then and the eyes are supposed to be almond shaped and when i say round it it actually makes them look buggy you know where the eyes are so rounded out so i like i 100 percent say the dogs are better now and you know with we didn't have hips and elbows and eyes and all that testing the dna that was not even on our schedule you just bred a dog and hope for the worst and hope it lasted a long time. That's what you did. And I think the biggest thing there was breeding for like bites because some of them dogs, oh my God, they had long hocks. And um, I look back at my old dogs and I think, oh my goodness, you come a long way. So I'm saying they're fit for function now um although i mean we had a lot of fabulous working dogs back then i'm really good friends with las ricosa that wrote the book about alices um and you know what she's even the she agrees there's the dogs are looking a lot better now but i think it's because of all the health testing I mean, you could see the appearance, all the genetics and the health testing were, you know, oh, the, the lots of problems. So it's gotten better. I'm going to say better. Super. So that will give a double thumbs up on that breed having gotten better over the decade. We want to go to the next one. So Aussies were originally developed in the USA. As on mm -hmm. date, which country or countries, according to you, are breeding true to that breed of the we will split it up. I will say US is one continent. You have your Europe, you have UK, you have uh, Australia, and maybe Asia also. We have Asia. we have beautiful dogs that are being bred in every country now. Mm -hmm. um, basically, um, I'll use this for an example, and I use myself. Many years ago, my dog bred a female. And we sent it over pregnant to Australia. And that litter really started that breed out there. Okay. Um, before that, the dogs were pretty poor. Um, and then that dog that we bred out there, she said, you look at him, Judy, and he's in like a lot of pedigrees. I'm like, great. Well, now um, we sent two dogs to Australia and there's a lot of people that want to breed to them out there. Um, they are fabulous dogs and I think they represent the breed very well. But I see some beautiful dogs coming from Canada. Uh, I love some dogs that are from France, I have, fr they come over here to our national specialty and compete. And um, they, there's beautiful breeders, beautiful dogs everywhere in the United States, everywhere in the world. Um, I wouldn't be afraid of bringing one of them dogs right back into my own program. So you say Australia, France, uh, countries that the dogs and Canada are countries where the dogs and the breeders become very strong. Those are just a couple that I know personally mm -hmm. of some beautiful dogs coming from them areas. 
but you know, in, in Australia, they're still trying to make their breed better. And that's why um, they wanted, you know, Rock and then they wanted Teddy. Um, but like I said, Rock, I sold him um, to a person from China. And he became very good friends. He tried, he came over to the Nationals when it was in Tennessee and he, that's when Apollo won everything. And he wanted to buy Apollo. And I'm like, I, I no, <laughs> um, I didn't want to sell rock, but you know, he convinced me. Um, and then he wanted Apollo and I'm like, uh, no, I need something that I can build my program off of. I can't keep on giving you all my good dogs. But I got puppies out of rock. I got puppies, out, you know, and I got semen and collected them really good before I left them. So, but I think Teddy's going to make a bump in the breed over there. And so, and rock has already. So there's a lot of nice dogs coming up. I've seen them from different various people that have um, dogs, not only from mine, but from other people too. I happen to know quite a few people in the Australian Shepherd community <laughs> all over the world. So how did uh, Rock end up moving from a China, person who bought it from China to Australia? So was it part of the original scheme that he moved from that place to Australia? That was so different. Um, it actually was... Hi, darling. Um, what was the river will help me? Just one second. Um, the um, I don't know where Hunter saw Rock the first time, but he was persistent that he had to have him. So he just kept on and kept on, and he and obviously they contact my son, and not me because um, because Kelly shows them and I put him on his co-breeder on a lot of on all my all my dogs now and um, so it takes they they saw him and he just kept on offering more and I kept on telling him he wasn't for sale and it just kept on um, and all of a sudden, we made the deal to sell them to this person from China. And then after that, um, Belinda saw him and asked him if she could bring Rock to Australia and show him. And then she just started messaging me and showing me all his wins. And I was like in seventh heaven. And then all of a sudden, the next thing you know, he became pretty famous and um, we got to be really good friends and really close. And I sent her, she, she came over to visit me and I entered Teddy in Westminster for her. So it kind of was a snowball effect where, it, you know, one thing led to another. And it just kept on getting bigger. And so now she, then she wanted Teddy over there. Um, so uh, that's what I did. I sent her another dog. And now she's in love with Teddy. So. <laughs> so did Rock return back or he's in Australia? Um, Rock is actually back in China. Oh, okay. And he is owned by Hunter Kong. And he is um, his little girl's favorite dog. <laughs> That's her buddy. That's He's retired. Okay, okay. So now uh, to talk about Teddy. So Teddy is a big topic for us, and uh, that's how I got inspired to yeah. you to ask you for an interview. So can you tell me about Teddy? Uh, in fact, Teddy Rutherford, uh, who went on to go to Australia and win the Sydney Royal Show 2021 Group, and also the Australian Shepherd Speciality Show. And I think he also won the runner-up best in show in Sydney Royal 2020. Correct. So, what is his story? 
Teddy story. Okay. He what he is out of actually the dog that the female that I have here. Her and um um her name is Shasta. And then I bred Teddy to I mean I bred Shasta to Apollo, the one that won the nationals. Okay. Um actually Teddy's story is a little sad. Um because what happened is there was a litter of six and um, <clears throat> it was an all black dry litter. Okay. And the farmer next to us was spraying his field because he had to go through um, because they want to kill all the mice and everything before they plow it. And um, he had two sisters um, and they got poisoned by the spray and died. Okay. Okay. So I, Teddy wasn't outside at the time that they sprayed. So okay. he actually l lived and um, he's just been amazing ever since. I mean, he does everything. You see the dog on the rock that you just had? Uh -huh. That's his dad. Okay. Um, that's Apollo. That's Apollo. Okay. And, okay. and Teddy is the one after that, right there. Okay. They look a lot alike. Um, I myself love Teddy. Mm -hmm. um, but he... He was raised as just a regular Australian shepherd. I mean, nothing special. When I bring them home, they they are in my house. They're house dogs like anybody else. They don't live in crates. I don't really let them uh, work too much out in the sun, you know, to keep their coats nice for show. But they, I put them away during the heat of the day, but I bring them out. Um, they're out of their crates a lot. Okay. I, I actually don't like that picture too much because it shows more drive than reach. Okay. Okay. I, I'm a big one on, on stuff like that. There, that okay. one is very nice. This is Teddy again, isn't it? Um, yeah. That, well, see, I have some that look the same. <laughs> and that could be um, a dog that I got at home as well, which is another beautiful dog. And his name is Orion. That is the Teddy's mother. Okay, okay. That's and then Teddy's Apollo is Teddy's father. Father, okay. Um, my son wants me to repeat the cross. Okay. Um, I don't know if I really want to. I mean, even though that they turned out really nice, I, I don't know if I want to repeat. I want to try something else, so. Wonderful. We had a wonderful time uh, discussing all this with you. We hope you mm -hmm. had the same uh, <laughs> happiness. Oh, yes. All the world of with us. So, thanks a lot uh, for your time, Julie. It was really great. And uh, thank you all. Uh, to our, thanks to our subscribers, uh, for, who are followers of the Jackson Inc. who are taking to patient and have been watching our session. So, all this uh, recorded message, uh, session will be available both in our Facebook page as well as our YouTube channel. So thanks a lot again. The third wave is coming up. That is what they are uh, scaring us with. So please be safe. Uh, stay at home. And don't go out if not necessary. And stay safe. Always wear a mask. Both myself and Judy are in wearing one because we are in secluded places. So take care. Stay safe. Thank okay. you. Stay, stay safe. Bye. Bye. -bye.